Hey everyone, now I'm serious here. This is the last video I am doing of season two, period, okay? This is the last one. I'm already churning through a lot of the lectures for Adobe Premiere Pro and stuff like that, and I feel that even if I can't be an expert at it by the time I get season three going, I think I can at least be proficient in it enough so that the next time I record videos, I can do it on that software rather than Camtasia. So maybe you will see the general quality improvement throughout season three, as opposed to right smack at the start, but I hope you'll at least get something out of it. So, you know, that's all coming. I'm still trying to find the time to learn it, but yesterday I went through a ton of those lectures learning through it, and. Udemy does do some pretty good courses on the subject, so we'll get on to that. But yep, this will be the last video of season two, and this is a bonus video that I wanted to get out before Christmas. Like, literally, I'm doing this on Christmas Eve, so um, before I go home to Somerset. And that is, I want to talk a bit more about 2018. I already did my top 10 list, and I mean, it's blowing my mind how popular it is at the moment. It's already at something like eight and a half thousand views, and I only put it up two days ago. It's insane. You know, thank you for watching it, and thank you for all the comments on it. You know, whether you disagree or agree with the choices, I love the debates that are going on. Such good comments. But I wanted to talk more about 2018 as a whole, because the, generally I liked the year. You know, I thought 2017 was a bit of a letdown. There was some decent games there, but most of them were just kind of, yeah, they're okay, they're a bit meh. You know, and then there was some overrated stuff, you know, Gloomhaven and all that lot. So I didn't really go for 2017 that much. 2018, I thought, did a better job at giving me a decent amount of good games rather than just meh and average. But that's not to say that this one wasn't full of a few overrated, disappointing, or cash grab titles as well. So. The problem with our hobby at the moment is that we're just getting flooded and flooded with so many games right now and it's impossible to A, play them all, and B, certain decent games are getting lost underneath the flood of all these other games that come out just because they're hyped up to like crazy levels or because they just happen to get publicised more, you know, like, what's the word, advertised better and, you know, they get to the forefront and some of them don't deserve to be at the forefront. So. I'm just basically, I don't have an official award <laughs> that I can give out to games. I mean, I'd love to get that in the future, you know, Patreon campaign, come on. But I certainly would love to be able to do that in the future. But for now, this is completely unofficial. I'm just giving out my personal choices for various categories like the Dice Tower Awards do and various other people. So I've just been filling out notes on it over the last couple of days. And, you know, I've been thinking about you know, surprises, disappointments, innovation, artwork, good and bad, production, good and bad, cash grab as a category for mine, uh, two player only, worst game of the year, thematic game, overrated game, reprint, family game. You know, I've come up with quite a few. In fact, the only major category I don't think I've done is party. And that's only because I never really got to play a lot of party games this year, which is a bit of a shame, really. I mean, I played Decrypto and one other, I think. Apart from that, there's a few party games I want to play, but they just never came on sale where I could find them. I mean, I want to play just one. That sounds like a great party game, but never got a chance to. And I've heard of other ones throughout the year, and it's just, for some reason, party games just don't seem to get a lot of buzz or get released in the UK much. So it's kind of weird, but I miss a good party game. I really do like them. So... Uh, I say, I'm no particular order, I'm just going to go from top to bottom in this list and just go through the categories and give you a couple of honourable mentions and just tell you what my favourite is and that's kind of all I'm doing here. So let's start with a good positive one and that is my favourite family game of the year. So when I think of family game I need it to A, be accessible to families, B, be appealing to families, and that includes children as well but doesn't have to be a kid's game. Adults should want to play this game as well, but of course, you can't make it too complicated for the kids, otherwise you're gonna have problems. And of course, it needs to be generally good value. You know, if it's a family game that costs like 60, 70 pound to buy, that's not the best of value for something you want to buy for the family. But you know, if it's like 20, 30 pounds, that's a lot better. So looking at the list, I had a fair few to choose from, and I, I ummed and ahmed with uh, Fireball Island, uh, The Curse of Volcar, but I thought it's a bit of a fiddly one, it's also quite expensive, and I don't know if, I mean that was a good second choice I thought, but I just felt it was a bit above the price point to be like a perfect family weight game. Not to mention small kids are going to have a field day with some of those marbles. Um, I also considered The River. The River is a solid worker placement game by Days of Wonder, and it is basically renamed as my first worker placement game. It's that simple. 
but perfect for families. You want to introduce them to worker placement? I can think of no better game to do it than that. But my personal vote goes to Reef. Reef is basically what for me has, even though they're not really that similar, if you're gonna put Azul and Reef in front of me, I'm gonna pick Reef every time. Reef is just a fantastic gateway level family game. All you're doing is draw a card or play a card, there's your two options, but you're basically trying to play the cards in such a way that you can build up these blocks of reef pieces on your board in such a way to score points. And you want to stack some of them up in towers, you want the colors to be grouped together if possible, and it's it's very tactical but super fast. I mean, it's easy to play, half the rules are on the back of the box, it, the turns are super fast, there's no downtime, and the game is done and dusted within 30 minutes, even with four players. Perfect for a family weight game. So, I mean, if you haven't checked out Reef, you really need to. Uh, let's see, next up, um, let's see. I'm gonna tick these off as I go. So tick family. Uh, let's go for reprint. Now, reprint. There's a particular caveat with reprint. It must be, as near as makes no difference, the same game as before. So I did consider Empires of the Void 2 briefly, but then I disqualified it because even though it's technically a reprint of the first one, it's so fundamentally different than the first one. I don't think it qualifies as a straight up reprint, otherwise it would be the top of this list easily. So I'm looking at a game that is pretty much identical to what it was before, or, you know, and, or is identical to what it was before. Now, surprisingly, I did consider Brass. Yeah, okay, I'm not the biggest fan of Brass, but I give it some respect. But I'm not talking about the Birmingham one. I mean, that's, well, we'll get onto that later. But, you know, I'm talking about Lancashire Brass, the straight up Lancashire reprint from Roxley Games. As much as I don't adore that game, if you're gonna do a reprint, that's how you do it. You take this game that looked horrible, absolutely vomit-inducingly bad in its old iteration. It looked so bad, it was unbelievable. And, you know, it had a horrible app to go with it. You know, they, they tried to make it an app and it was horrendous. It just didn't look good. Oh, my, bleh, I just really hated it. But this is how you do it properly. You put some of the best artwork I have seen ever that probably doesn't even deserve to be in this game, but it, it's in this game anyway. You give you clay poker chips if you bought the upgraded version. You know, you put a really nice finished board, you put proper cards, you put photorealistic artwork, you just up the production quality to ridiculous levels, and you get something that is worthy of a reprint. So, you know, my top, that, that was a very close reprint for me, but, not my favorite. The favorite reprint I have, which I feel has, it's gonna bring it back to the limelight. I think it's up to production quality to what it really needs to. It's gonna be more appealing to a lot of people. But my personal favorite was by a margin. I mean, that was oh, this or brass, this or brass. But this one for enjoyment factor, I think has to go to Camel Up Second Edition. The Camel Up Second Edition, it adds a new rule with you know partnerships and the crazy camels that go backwards, which is really good fun. But I wasn't that desperate for the old camel up. I thought the components were chintzy, it didn't look that great. That pyramid was basically just a cardboard mess. You know, not particularly great. This one though, oh my god. You open the board and it's got this huge pop-up oasis which does nothing but just look good cosmetically. The camels are solid chunky wood. The tiles are now nice, thick and sturdy. The artwork has jumped up to 11. It looks gorgeous. So much so that Camel Up is now in my collection in the other room as a solid gateway game that I love to pull out for anywhere up to eight players. You know, this, I would have never even considered putting Camel Up in my collection before this reprint. Now the reprint's out, it's in my collection and it will stay. So it had to go to Camel Up in the end, but it was close, very close. Okay, let's counterbalance this with a, let's see, let's go for a negative one here. Not the worst game, I'm gonna save that for a bit longer. Let's go for Cash Grab. Ah, cash Grab! <laughs> now, I want innovation in my games, okay? I want, we're getting flooded with so many games I'm getting sick and tired of people just churning out the same old stuff all the time. It's getting infuriating. You know, at this rate, nothing's gonna change and we're just gonna get the same old stuff every time of which the cult and the new are basically gonna go, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. And then people like myself who are a bit more, I say balanced or more towards cult of the old are gonna be like, well, I got this game right here. Why do I need this one? You know, everyone bangs on about Century Spice Road, but I've got Splendor. 
I prefer Splendor and it's a similar feel. You know, why would I want that if I've got this? It's, it's that kind of thing. But oh my god, there are some times when I just see a game and it's just like, it has got cash grab literally stamped on the front. There is no reason for it to exist other than just a quick buck earner for the publisher, for a way to get it hyped, for the designer to literally just take five and not bother with designing too much in the next game. It's like, you know, these get on my nerves. And there were some doozies this year. Loosely, I considered Founders of Gloomhaven because literally after playing that game, it's not that interesting, it's way too long, it doesn't look great, it's pretty fiddly as old get out, but the only reason this got hyped up like crazy is because he stenciled the word Gloomhaven in it. That was why everybody was like, oh my god, another Gloomhaven game, I must have it, oh! <laughs> but it's not that great. And literally, people are already seeing that it's not that great a game. There's some lovers, there's some fans of it, but most people, Thought it was average at best. Yeah, so that was a consideration, but no, that's not direct cash grab. Because it is fundamentally different from Gloomhaven, so I had to give it props. Um, I did consider Brass mainly because, the, and this is Brass Birmingham. Yeah, because Brass Birmingham, everyone's going, oh my god, it's my favourite game of the year, my best new game of 2018. Hello guys, it's Lancashire with beer at it. <laughs> it's literally what the game is. You can make the locations different, whatever. You know, Ticket to Ride does that all the time. You know, you can basically say, oh, but now you have a, you know, the flexible market thing. So it's like, okay, you could have literally done that with a variant with some tiles in Lancashire. That's not exactly a whole new game. But everyone sort of goes, oh yeah, the beer now makes it fundamentally different. It's not that fundamentally different, guys. It still feels like Lancashire. It's still basically, right, okay, so I've got to mess around with turn order with this money. i got to get my stuff on the board. Oh, yeah, still got to do that um, coal and iron thing, which is still the best thing to do in the game. And now I just have to consider that beer is essential, which basically just makes the game more punishing than Lancashire, which is not a good thing. But, you know, it's got some differences, but come on, guys. I, I just, even if it would have made my top 10, I disqualified it on my caveat of too similar to the original game. But every brass fan is going on that this is the best thing of 2018. It's like, I, I feel that it's basically just a standalone expansion. It's basically got as, as much variation as a Ticket to Ride map pack. But my vote, easy cash grab. The, the number one has to go to Azul Stained Glass of Sintra. Come on, Plan B. You know better than this. You've come up with some decent stuff over the years. And even if I don't think they're the best games ever, Century Spice Road is hugely popular. Fair enough, I give it respect, I prefer Splendor. Yeah, um, Azul, I actually have Azul on my shelf down there. I prefer the original Azul to Stained Glass of Syndrome. And when Azul came out, it's like, okay, this is cool. I don't love it, but I've taught it so many times, people want to play it. Great. This is a cash grab, pure and simple. I'm sorry. If you think that this is so widely different from Azul, seriously, take off your sunglasses that are tinted with Azul love and think about this. What is different in this game? Literally, you have taken out the mosaic, like, oh, let's see, well, what do you do in Azul? You take tiles from the middle, you draft them from each tile, and they go into the middle, and then you keep going until all the tiles are taken, you put them on your board, and you try to fill up certain colors as fast as you can. What do you do in Azul 2.0? You took some tiles in the middle, you draft them from there, the tiles go into the middle, you grab them until all of them have run out, and you put them on your windows as fast as you can. Hang on a minute, where's the difference? Literally, your difference is you have this titty little meeple that moves along the windows to say where you can place them, and you have window tiles with a slight different scoring mechanism than the mosaic ones. That's your difference. 90% of this game is Azul. The core thing of what I even like about Azul is the drafting of the tiles and how you've got those tactical choices. That's exactly the same in this one. All you have done is literally change the scoring mechanism. And the scoring mechanism isn't even that interesting. A and B side of scoring in Azul is a fundamentally different game. A and B side in 2.0 Stained Class of Sintra is literally two very similar scoring mechanisms. That's it. They're not different. And even then, Stained Glass Syndra has the problem of being more luck dependent than Azul was. You know, you can have a game, you can have a round where tiles come out of a certain colour and your windows just don't happen to require that colour. You're screwed. You have no way to recover after that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I could rant on more, but I'm sorry. You know, both of them are decent enough games. 
I prefer the original as all. If you prefer stained glass to Syndra, fantastic, great. That's no problem, you know, because I give both games respect. But people saying you can own both, no, no. You, you own one of them, yes, definitely own one of them. But you don't need both. Pick your poison, which one do you prefer, the windows or the mosaic? And there you go, that's pretty much it. So definitely, Azul 2.0, Stained Glass of Sintra, you know, it's too long of a name. That is easily the biggest cash grab of the year. Right, well after doing cash grab, how about we go back to positive and go for the best innovative game this year. This was actually quite tricky. There's been a few games this year that I've actually pushed the envelope and tried something different. Now, this one had to be the level of innovation, you know, like doing something really vastly different to what's been done before and having it still succeed. So I considered War Chest. War Chest was on my top 10 of the year and I think that that, that coin bag building along with the abstract war game was very different. Very different indeed and it works very well. I really enjoyed that one as a good two player game. But there were some better ones that I could think of. I mean I was also considering Selenia. Selenia has a really cool mechanic where as you move this airship along the tiles you take the back one, flip it over and put it at the front and it looks like you're sailing through day and night. That's really cool and all the cards have little portholes on them that you put down so you can see what's underneath it. Really cool idea, that was very close. And I did briefly consider what was it, the Architects of the West Kingdom, which as much as, uh, spoiler alert, is my top, my top game of the year, it certainly did a good twist on worker placement, but that was kind of the main innovation it did. So my personal vote goes to Keyforge. Keyforge is a really cool two-player card game from, um, you know, from the same guy who did Magic the Gathering. Uh, why have I got Richard Garfield? And... It's, it's got some cool mechanics, like, you know, you've got three different factions and you choose one every turn and you can do as much as you like with that faction, but only that faction, really cool decisions. But this was the main pioneer of the whole unique game system, which means that every deck is unique and it's such an easy entry point. You just go out, buy a deck, there you are, you can play Keyforge. That's literally as much of an entry point as you need. You can buy multiple decks, yeah, but that's your choice. You don't have to buy pack after pack after pack, you could just buy one pack. And there you go, you're done. Great little system. The balancing has yet to be determined, but it does have a system in place that if your deck is particularly good, you can balance the two decks so that one person is at a handicap. So, you know, it's a nice innovative way, a way to do that as well. So yeah, Keyforge for me, I thought was a very good refreshing change. I really like it, not quite top 10 material, but it certainly was just something very different. You know, very different and that's what I want to see innovation in my games. Okay, took that one off. Let's see, how many good ones have I got left? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six good ones. And I've got one, two, three, four bad ones. Okay, so let's get another, let's get a couple more um, good ones out of the way then. Uh, I'm gonna go with, let's see, something that's, uh, all right, here we go. Thematic, thematic games. Oh yeah, I love theme. I love theme, you know I love theme, you know, theme is a big contender for why I love a game, you know, and not to say every game has to have theme, you know, hello, Pulsar 2849 much, but, you know, the more it has a strong theme, the more it will draw me back to wanting to play it more often, and I can forgive some slightly dodgy mechanics if the theme is so good and engrossing, whereas I can't forgive poor mechanics or annoying mechanics if the game is so bone dry I didn't feel like it in the first place, it's, you know, that's the way it is. This year, I felt we were a bit lacking on thematic games, really. I mean, there was a fair few, but I don't know. I just, there weren't as many that sort of grabbed me at first. This year seems to have been mostly about fairly dryish Euros, and fair enough, that seems to be the trend now. But some did go through, and I certainly have to give them props. Um, again, I did consider Empires of the Void 2, you know, the very good thematic space game. You know, all the planets have got different events that trigger off, all the races feel different, you diplomatize with some, you conquer others. It, that was a really good thematic experience. But I also had to consider uh, Detective, as in Detective, the uh, portal game right there, the deduction, heavy deduction game. Ripe in theme, you feel just like those CSI agents in the in the TV shows, you know, one person on the computer, one taking notes, solving this really intriguing, engrossing plot for, you know, for a typical sort of police drama. Really cool, bit heady for some, but, you know, it's a really good thematic game. But I had to give props to the one that, even though this is a theme I don't tend to go for all the time, 
This game is literally just oozing in this theme, and that's Western Legends. Western Legends, I'm not the biggest Western fan in the world. You know, for a great Western so much. But, you know, if you can call that fanatic, not. But with Western Legends, oh yeah, I mean, you play this game and, you know, you want to be the outlaw, the marshal, you want to be ranting cattle, you want to be a prospector, you want to go play poker, you want to, you know, get just get drunk in a bar and talk about your deeds, you want to, you know, use, you're using poker cards for all the actions, you can do what you like. It's a great sandbox Western game and it just oozes theme. I mean, if you just, if you squeeze it, the literally floods out. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of like... Think of The Shining, <laughs> that scene where all the blood comes out the door and it, a bad analogy, but you know, that scene from The Shining, I think it's The Shining, you know, it's basically that, but imagine that theme coming out of Western Legends, it's just pouring everywhere, and it's one reason I love it so much, it's one reason it hit my top 10 of the year, it's just, you know, I want a quintessential Western game that I can put some music on in the background, some guitar and harmonica going along, and there you go, it's just so, such a good essence of theme, and yeah, can't say enough about it. Okay, and next good one, let's go for expansion. Expansions, love expansions. I like expansions more than I like a new game because a new game, it's got to teach me something completely different and chances are it's not always gonna work. Whereas an expansion, you get some iffy expansions, but generally it's going to expand a game I already like or possibly even fix a game I don't like. So expansions I do look forward to. And I had a lot to choose from this year. There were some pretty good ones. Uh, Seven Wonders Armada was tempting. The, the I'll probably put that in a compilation review in Season 3 because I know I haven't done a single review on it. But yeah, Seven Wonders Armada is a solid, a solid way to expand the base game of Seven Wonders without necessarily being forced to put leaders and cities into it. Base set plus Seven Wonders Armada is enough to give it enough... Sorry, is enough to give it a fresh outlook without having to stick all the expansions in, which is how I generally like to play it anyway. So Armada was definitely worth considering. Uh, Prelude to Terraforming Mars. Not the biggest fan of Terraforming Mars, but I warmed up to it a bit more now, and a lot of it is down to the Prelude expansion, so I gotta give it props. This basically shaves a good two to three generations off the time length of the game, and that's one of the biggest issues I have, is that the downtime and the time length of Terraforming Mars is way too long for what is basically a mid-weight drafting game. So, you know, being able to shorten it and give you a differentiated starting setup, always a plus point in my book. And Prelude does that in spades. I refuse to play this game without Prelude. That's how useful it was. But, you know, there was slightly better than that. Uh, Abyss Leviathan. Uh, Abyss down there, cool. Leviathan fixes the one problem I had with the base set. And then it's basically made Abyss one of my top 10 favorite games. It is just so good now with that expansion. But... It only really brought that in. There wasn't much else on top of it. So my vote goes to Scythe, the Rise of Fenris. As if Scythe could get any better. Oh, it did. <laughs> the campaign itself is already good fun to go through as it introduces the elements. But even if you just ignore the campaign and just think, you know what, don't need it. I'm just going to shove the modules in this game into my game of Scythe. Oh my god, they're good modules. You can now customize the Triumph track so it's different every game. You can now have, you know, customized mods for your board. You can have customized mods for your mechs. You can, ah, oh, and these, even just those three modules alone completely revamp the experience of Scythe. The other modules are still pretty sweet as well. You've now got, well, actually saying that, I don't want to... Don't want to spoil too much, you know, but suffice to say, the other stuff in that expansion, I will use every single game, and the campaign is still good fun to go through. Honestly, if you like Scythe and you really want to spice it up, you need that expansion. It is a must buy. So it had to get the best vote here. Okay, so I think we're now left with four good. One, two, three, uh, four. Yep, and one, two, three, four. Yep, so. Four of each. Let's go on to, I want to end on a high note. So let's start with a disappointing, let's start, let's start with disappointment. Here we go, disappointing game. Now, it's, if anything, a game that I expect to be bad and is bad, eh, whatever, not really caring. Yeah, I can get used to that sort of thing. But when a game you hope is going to be great just falls flat, oh, it hurts you inside, especially when it's a designer and a publisher that you give respect. You cut me deep, Shrek. You cut me real deep just now. And yeah, there was a lot of disappointments this year. Uh, Ceylon from Essen, I was expecting a lot better for a theme about making tea. I thought, oh yeah, I've not seen this theme before. I really want it to be great. 
and it's basically just move around a map, put some leaf tokens on, do this cube, like turn cubes into victory points, and it just wasn't very thematic for a game about making tea, and it's like, bleh, was not as big of a fan of that one. It's not bad, but I wanted more. Uh, Imaginarium, that's all right. It looked funky as all get out. I mean, the artwork on it is just bizarre. And I thought, oh, please let the, the game and the theme match this weird artwork. Yeah, it's a bone dry engine builder. And it's not even that great of an engine builder. It's okay, but you know, it's kind of, it drags on for ages with anybody with AP and there's not many paths to victory. So that was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, Nemesis was another one. I, I like it. Okay. It certainly was a potential for the most thematic game, but you know, it does have some weird things about it. And uh, yeah, I probably should have mentioned this with the thematic games category. Actually, I did consider it, but the problem Nemesis has is, you know, it's just far too long far too long for something that has player elimination and semi-co-op involved. This game takes easy like two and a half to three hours to finish every four plus player game, despite the fact that you don't do a lot on your turn. It only takes one player to slow it down and the admin and stuff as well. It's just, there's so much to consider. There's a lot going on and it just takes forever. You know, this really should just be a 60 to 90 minute game and it never takes that long unless you're playing it by yourself or with one other player. With a full group, it's just too long. But you know, and also player elimination. I don't want that in a game that can last hours. What if you get kicked out halfway through because somebody had the objective to kill you off as their main thing? Oh great, they succeeded early and killed you off. Well, now what do you do? It's, it's, a, it's a fine, I'll play it, but I've really got to be specific about who I play this with and how many players before I really get back into it. It's, it's a shame though, because the theme is so good. Um, but. Yeah, biggest disappointment, Discover Lands Unknown. Oh my god, this was uh, such a disappointment. I mean, the unique game system had already made its way with Keyforge, and I thought, oh yeah, where can we take this in a board game? But I was skeptical. I thought, can this pull it off? Is this not going to work for a board game as it does for a card game? And I thought, ooh, survival game, you know, I'll go with that, but it's made by FFG and Corey Ganetska, a great publisher and a great designer. It's got to work, right? Blech. No, it didn't. It was boring, it was repetitive. The fact that it came with two different bits of terrain really made little difference apart from just slightly differentiating what cards you picked up. And the plots were predictable and not particularly interesting. Literally the only thing this game had going for it was the fact that the turns were really quick and as a solo game, it was pretty fast and pretty you know streamlined. But yeah, everything else about it just fell really flat and I expected this to be great or at least something better than what it was, so yeah. Discover Lands Unknown, biggest disappointment. So let's move on to surprises. Now, yeah, when a surprising game comes through, that's such a good feeling. You know, a game that disappoints you is horrible. In the flip side, a game that's like, mm, I don't expect it to be that great. And then you go, Wah! you know, that is one of the best feelings you can get from a board game. And there was a few to consider, actually. This was the biggest surprise in them all, that there was a lot of surprises, funny enough. Everdale was tempting. Yeah, you know, Everdale, I thought, oh great, this is another hyped up Kickstarter, it's got a giant tree, whatever, it's a gimmick. You know, how good can this be? Turned out pretty good, it made my top 10 of the year. <laughs> it's a solid game, you know, light tableau builder, with like, great production and artwork, as you're getting this collection of woodland critter creatures, and you know, their, you know, their various locations, and trying to come up with combos, and sort of build up a little engine. Neat little game. Uh, but, you know, it did look nice, so I was thinking, yeah, you know, maybe this has potential. I also considered Rayholt, uh, Rayholt or Rayholt, however you pronounce it, the Icelandic uh, greenhouse farming game from Uri Rosenberg. Didn't think I was going to go mad for it. I mean, I like Uri Rosenberg games, but I thought, well, he did Newsport the other year, and that was pretty bare bones and average. So, is this just going to be another one of those? Turned out, though, it's a very cool game. People are really liking it. It's just a nice light to mid worker placement game that is, you know, gives you that farming feel of growing vegetables, but rather than having victory points, it's a race around an exterior track to feed the tourists. It's just very quick, very streamlined, shouldn't take too long unless you've got some AP players, you know, keep them off this game. Well produced, it was a generally a good surprise and it's still sitting in my collection. But my biggest surprise of the year was passing through Petra. This one I looked at and I thought, okay, Canyon Walls, definitely a gimmick. Tiles, just messing around with tiles. Okay, I don't think the theme's going to be particularly strong here, you know, but is it going to be a good game? 
Turned out it was. Not enough to be top 10 material, but I really was thinking that this was just going to be like, meh, don't care, meh, you know, not too fast. This one I think is going to fly under the radar for a lot of people, and I think you should give it a shot. It's a, it's, it's kind of a tile manipulation game. You're trying to circle around all these different rondelles for different nations, and it doesn't matter what nation is what or what they trade. I mean, it's not very thematic at all. But the idea is, is you're trying to place out your influence cubes, and the first one to do it wins the game. So again, no victory points. I like it when you stop doing that. But the tile manipulation is a really cool puzzle. It's kind of the... Gives me a similar feeling to how you play Otis. If you remember that one with the divers and you've got to rearrange the divers in such a way to be at the right place at the right time, this is kind of similar. You have to manipulate your market board so that these tiles come on on the left, they push off tiles on the right that go above your board and then you can use them to do the market trade actions. But you, they trade with certain partners. So the purple ones you need to, you know, for example, you know, trade with the reds. So you want purples at the top and red at the bottom. You've got to manipulate the tiles in such a way that you can do this. But on top of that, you've got cards for special abilities and uh, power-ups. You've also got uh, multiple scoring opportunities with the cubes. And you've got little bonuses you can grab. And I really like the grid system with the little pawn that you move to dictate what action you do. So whichever direction you move in is the action you're allowed to do, but you can only move so far. So you have to balance out your actions. You know, you can't just spam the same one all the time. It's really cool, yet also frustrating in a good way at the same time. And this was a big surprise. Enough that it's in the collection, it will stay there. It's not particularly complex, although <laughs> read a certain bit in the rule book really carefully, because if you get this wrong, it will break the game. But, you know, it's not too difficult to play, pretty straightforward to explain. The walls are a bit of a gimmick, but they look cool on the board, you know, and the tiles do slide in between them, not too bad, but again, it's a bit fiddly. And yeah, generally, I really enjoyed it. I didn't think it was going to appeal to me as much as it did, but it was just a really cool puzzle in a streamlined, short game. I mean, this is a 60 unit game, possibly 90 taps. It's really cool little game and you really should try it out. Passing through Petra. Okay, what are we on next? Uh, do, do, do. Okay, I wonder, let's see, we've got, oh, I think I've miscounted the number, oh, no, 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 six, six categories to the left, seven, I think I've miscounted the amount of categories I've got left, oh, well, <laughs> it's a bit of a surprise, so let's go with, uh, very quickly, two-player game, two-player only game, and yes, you might be able to play these with more players, but they're more of a variant as opposed to how you should play it. I considered quite a few here. I mean, uh, Keyforge was very tempting. Keyforge is a solid two-player card game. Won't belittle it. I've already explained it. Princess Jing was another one. This one, I think, is going to fly under the radar, but it's a very well-produced game from Madigo where you're trying to hide your princess from the opponent as you move your princess through these, like, sort of weird... I don't know, like statue things, you know, alcoves, and you can manipulate where these alcoves are. But you've also got this guy with a little mirror that if you look through the holes, you can try and see the mirror and try to see where the princess is. It's a really cool two player back and forth game, probably overproduced for what it is, but it's a very neat idea. Uh, Jewelosaur Island, I think could be the top of this list, but I have not played it. It came out too late in December for me to consider it for this. I'm sorry, but I will get it played soon, probably as a compilation review uh, edition. But yeah, I want to play it. It does look cool, but just haven't had a chance yet. So for now, two-player game goes to War Chest. War Chest, that innovative bank building coupled with an abstract war game. Yes, you can play this as a, a 2v2, but honestly, it's best played as a one-on-one. One-on-one, -on -one. One -on -one, pure Drawing out the bag, you know, how do I tailor my bag? Do I make it all the different units or do I tailor it to just a couple? The different unit cards, every game for both players, so you're differentiated. Makes for vastly different gaming experience as you play it. Not that difficult to learn. The rules reference is barely a page. And yeah, it's a solid abstract war game that I didn't expect much from. This surprised me a bit as well. But it, yeah. As a two-player game, it's a really good strategic and tactical two-player game. It definitely deserves props. War Chest. So, next up, let's go to... I want to... Hmm, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think I've miscounted how many bads I've got left, actually. I've got four bads and two goods. <laughs> I don't know how I've managed to do this. It's because I'm not going from top to bottom anymore. But let's... All right, we're going to have to do a couple of bad one, uh, bad ones then. So... No, we'll save the two bad for the end. Yeah, I'm going to save those for those. So let's start off with 
production quality. Yes, production quality in a game really matters. I love good production in a game, and I think that these days you've got to up your level with regards to the production quality, or it's going to fall by the wayside. So let's uh, let's talk about my best and my worst. So best production first off. This was hard. There was a lot of good production quality this year, and I think there's going to be a lot of different opinions, and I think it just has to come to which one, when I see it on the table, do I just go, ah, oh. it like, does it, does it just sing to me when I, when I put it down? And I mean, I considered Ray Colt. Ray Colt's got lovely artwork. It's got the little wooden, not wooden, um, the sort of like cardboard uh, case things that you build to hold all the components in. They're wooden components. They're shaped. You know, really nice production. Uh, Cerebria, again, great, beautiful artwork, but artwork's a separate category, but you do get the miniatures, and then I thought, well, hang on, most of this is Kickstarter, so I had to, it's a very good production, but a lot of it was Kickstarter-based, and I had to disqualify it for that. Uh, Teotihuacan, or whatever you pronounce it as, really, it's a great production, you've got those uh, domino wooden tiles, you've got all the different chits, you've got a board that looks great, but I thought, Maybe half of it is down to the artwork as well, and you know, it's still really good production quality, but in the end, I felt that I had to go with Rising Sun. Rising Sun, as well as having good artwork, has got some fantastic components for like, you know, the different war tiles, your honor things, the negotiation things, your player boards, and you know, like the combat boards, the money, but, and this is without even considering the Kickstarter versions of it, but the miniatures, oh my god, the miniatures are so good, not just for your players, but those monster miniatures are amazing as well. It's an expensive game, I will say, but wow, when you get all those miniatures on the board and you have any sprawling battles, it just looks the business. This is one of my favorites, if not probably the favorite game I have from Cool Mini or Not, and that's saying something because I don't tend to have a lot of their games, but for Rising Sun really did up the bar with some production quality for this year, but I will accept that a lot of people are going to have different opinions on this one because there was just a lot of good choice. I give it credit. If you preferred one of those other three that I just mentioned, I can see exactly why. There's probably several other games out there that uh, you might say uh, even weren't on that list of four and you think they were better production quality. I mean, um... Lords of Hellas looks pretty sweet as well, you know, I have not played it, so I didn't really think about it that much, but, you know, Lords of Hellas, if somebody thinks that's better production quality than Rising Sun, I could probably see why, it does look pretty sweet. So, this was a hard one to do. However, worst production quality, oh my god, yes, as well as being some good ones, there were some pretty bad ones. Now, when I think worst production, I don't just think, oh god, this looks horrible, bleh. I've also got to consider the price point. You give me a game that costs 10 bucks and it's bad production quality. Well, I'm paying 10 bucks for it, which expect. There's only so much you can give me for 10 bucks. So something like Cryptid, that does look pretty horrible. It's not that expensive a game. It's basically a little deduction filler. So it's, it, there's only so much you're paying for here. So I've got to think about the price point. And there were two that sprung to mind. Rise of Tribes. Bleh. That's not a particularly well-produced game. It's not even a very good game. But... You know, Kickstarter improved on certain aspects of it, but the retail version of it, oh my god, some of those components are horrible. But, but I had to give, it. it's not the most expensive game in the world, and it's okay production, but still not great. But also, I, I can't remember who published it, but I think it was like a fairly newish publisher, I wasn't that desperate for their stuff anyway. This one, though, is a publisher that should know better. They've done some great production in the past. They did uh, the reprint of Camel Up 2.0. But yeah, my worst production here, the one that just made me go, what is this? You should know better for this amount of money, Blackout. Oh my god. Forget the fact that there's practically no artwork in the game. Just cubes for resources. A board that is pretty much entirely black. Uh, black bordered cards that are so wafer thin that the second you touch them, they already start scathing. And, you know, and, and just little token shits and, you know, not a particular, it, it pretty bad production. For a game that is not cheap, this is not a cheap game to acquire, it's a full priced game. And on top of that, it's Spiel. You know better, Spiel. You have done some great production in the past, or at least decent production, and then you came out with that. What? How did you think this was going to work? I don't get where the thinking was on this. Yes, okay, it's blackout. Let's make everything black. That doesn't make for a good production game just because you want to tie it into the title. It, uh, 
was not a big fan of this one for, for the publisher and the reputation they had for what was a pretty expensive game to acquire. Come on, you can do better. Uh, let's see, okay, we've done production. Let's go to artwork. Yes, artwork. Now, again, tough choice. <laughs> it was a good artwork this year. Things are just starting to look so beautiful and I love it. You know, I mean, people people still defend Ethnos as being a really good looking game. Seriously, what do you want? But, you know, there were some good choices for artwork, both bad and good. So let's start off with the good. Um, I really, like I say, Everdell, very nice looking artwork, you know, that everything's colourful, it looks very forest-like, and I mean, I think out of the ones I considered, that was probably my second choice. It really does look beautiful. I also considered Brass. Okay, Brass is not my favourite game in the world, but I gotta give it props. My god, I want that artwork in another game. I want that. It looks so nice, even if it does look a bit dreary. It's either nighttime or it's wet and miserable. So... It's not the best setting to depict an artwork, but my god, there's no denying that the artwork in Brass is beautiful and fantastic. Uh, Cerebria was another consideration, very good artwork throughout. Bit of a busy board, but vibrantly colourful, you've got all these different emotions on the cards, it just, oh, it does quite jump off the table, I must admit. But for me, I had to think... When I look at a game, it's a bit like the production, which one just sings to me? Which one do I want to play partially just because of the artwork? Or which game that when I put it out on the table, am I always saying, God, I think this is so beautiful, I love it. And that's Empires of the Void 2. Empires of the Void 2, Ryan Luckett's artwork is fantastic. And in Empires of the Void 2, oh my God, it looks so divine when it's on the table. All those blues and blacks together of the planetscapes, the, the different color planets, all the, the hand-drawn the hand style of all the races and you know, your, your player boards and the, the cards themselves. Artwork just oozes from that game in such high quality and the board is a thing of beauty. Mwah. I love the game already, but yeah, every time I put it on the table, I just have to take a minute to stare at it and just admire the craftsmanship of that artwork. It's like, oh yes, so good. It had to be my personal pick. Worst artwork. Woo! <laughs> Some of these games really did just make me want to vomit in terms of how bad the artwork is. Now, one thing I will caveat, and I could say this about production as well, I say about artwork, it's a very subjective viewpoint. The eye of the beholder is going to be different for everyone. One man's vomit-inducing artwork is another man's, you know, thing of beauty on the wall. So take this with a pinch of salt. This is just what really there for me. I did consider Founders of Gloomhaven. It's browns, it's greys, it's horrible muted greens. I mean, the player boards are okay, but the rest of it just looks really dull. <laughs> Especially with all these little chits everywhere. I mean, it's not a very nice looking game. I also consider Dice Settlers, you know, I mean, I give the designer props for his solo modes and anachrony and stuff like that, but, you know, Dice Settlers didn't win me over as much, and as much as I'm sure the artist has gone on to great things, I really did not like the art in this game. The tiles look super bland, the woman on the player boards, I swear, is staring into my soul, she is, like, creepy as old get out, oh my god, ah! <laughs> and even the dice themselves don't look that great, so... Yeah, artwork was a bit of a low point for this, but oh my god, and uh, to be fair, I've not played this game, I've just seen pictures, I've just seen it being played, but oh my god, <laughs> seriously, this game looks, I mean, this could have made bad production, it looks bad production, but artwork-wise, oh my god, there is nothing about the aesthetics of this game that makes me want to even consider playing it, and that's before you even get to the fact that it's done by one of my least favourite designers ever, Stefan Feld, but, and this is just because I don't like that style of game, not because he's actually a bad designer, but, oh my god, Carpe Diem, what is this? <laughs> There is bad, and then there's horrendous, and then there is seventh layer of hell bad artwork. This is so, ah, it's making me feel sick just talking about it. If you have not seen Carpe Diem and you think, oh yeah, this is a really good fun Svelde game, there is no way you're defending your artwork in this. You can say as much praise as you like about the game itself and its mechanics, whatever, that's what most people talk about with Feld, because you certainly don't talk about the theme. But the aesthetics of this game, you cannot say it's got good artwork or good aesthetics. No, you can't. Don't even try. 
If you do, then I don't know what to say, because if that is your high bar for good aesthetics, then what on earth is Empires and, and Rising Sun and Everdell, what are they? I mean, if, if you think Carpe Diem looks good, does looking at Everdell make your eyes literally bleed? It's like with gorgeousness. It's like, how can you get much worse? Carpe Diem, horrible looking game. And I'm not exactly expecting it to win me over as a mechanical game, but that's just because I'm not a failed fan. There. So horrible. So horrible. Okay. We got two categories left. And they're both bad ones. Yeah, maybe I should have come up with more good categories. Or maybe I shouldn't have gone through all the good categories first. But, uh, yeah. Two I'm going to start with. I'm going to start with overrated. Overrated slash overhyped. Because I hate hyping games. I mean, there are games that I love like Scythe. And even I admit that was overrated. Because people think of these games as the second coming. It's so bad how hyped these games get. What's that Tainted Grail one at the moment? I mean, I know little about it. I mean, okay, it's got an interesting theme and it's got cool miniatures. Now everybody's going, yes, back it is amazing. Oh, but how much do you really know about the game? <laughs> it's like giving the chance to come out and actually play it before you start thinking it's the next Jesus. But yeah, you know, I really don't like hype. And people will praise games loads and I will just think, why? You know, it's fine, but it's not that good <laughs> you know it's not fantastic and there was plenty of choices for this one as well blackout was a consideration people were hyped up like crazy over this they were thinking oh my god yes this is going to be great i want to buy it i want to buy it i want to buy it but seriously you know it's not that great of a game it's pr prone to ap it's too long it looks horrible and but people were hyped up about this game with knowing nothing about it literally nothing about this game they didn't know anything they just went with it Seriously? Come on, play it first. And then you might realize it's not actually as great as you think. It was a consideration, but I don't think this one's getting as much buzz as I expected it to. I think most people are playing it and going, yeah, some people love it, but I'm not seeing it getting this hyped as much, so I disqualified it then. Um, I did consider Coimbra. Coimbra is a good game. I like Coimbra. It's in the collection. I don't know how much longer, though, because it's super dry. There is no theme in this game, and uh, it's fine. I mean, the dice mechanic is the best thing I like about it, but at the end of the day, you're moving your guy on this map just to get tiles, and you've just got four tracks that you're leveling up. It's more tracks, tracks, tracks. <laughs> this, is good. this is good enough to be a meme at this rate. Tracks, tracks, tracks. But it's, like I say, it's a super dry Euro game. It's fine. I don't have a problem with it per se, but everyone thinks it's so amazing, and I don't... I'm not getting that same level of enjoyment from it as others are. Not to say it's a bad game, I just think, you know, come on. But, and this was a tough one, because I did think Blackout might win this one over. But, loads of people are putting this as their tap, like, game of the year. And it doesn't even feel like that new a game. Like I said, I mentioned this in my cash grab category. But, it, I give it respect, but... Brass is not that fantastic. I, I, I give it respect, but I still think it's overrated. You know, it's, it's a very long, very punishing Euro game. The theme is there, but it's not the most interesting theme in the world. I mean, whoopee, you're building coal and ironworks in the Industrial Revolution era. Yay! It's like so thematic and interesting. No. But, I mean, it's got some theme, but really it's about as interesting as saying trains. And, well, you're building railroad links, so it's got some aspect of trains. But everyone's lording over this, and it's just like, it's an economic game. You're just balancing your checkbook. You're, you're doing stuff with money purely for turn order purposes, which is just kind of weird when I see that in games. And, you know, at the end of the day, it goes on for longer than it should. There's a lot of luck in those cards. I mean, if you don't draw the right cards, you are screwed because you cannot afford to take the slow route to getting the place that you want because... People are doing more actions than you, and if you, there's not a lot of actions you're doing in the game, so losing an action is pretty painful. But for me, I just find it too punishing. You make a wrong move early in the game, and you are done. You will not recover. You can play the long game by doing slightly worse in the first era to be better in the second era. That's fine. But if you make a quintessentially wrong choice, and it might not even be your fault, you might have just gone for something and then someone's blocked you out of it, you're screwed. You can't recover and you're just sitting there on like, like pseudo knockout times two. It's 
I, I don't, don't go. I don't go for the most punishing Euro games. I want flexibility. I want to be able to do my own thing. I want a mistake to be potentially correctable, not like destroy me for the whole game. And but everyone's like top nine of the year, brass, 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 brass. Even though it's basically just brass with beer on it. It's it's fine. I'll give it respect. You know, I mean, I'm not a massive fan of Martin Wallace's games anyway, but I have to say that this is probably one of my favourites that he's done. <laughs> Saying something. But, yeah, everyone's lording over it. And it's just like, it looks cool. It's a great reprint. I'll give it that. But, my God, it's getting hyped up like crazy. It's not... I just don't think it's all that in a bag of chips. So, <laughs> you can tell I'm British. So, yeah, Brass took the spot just on the overrated side. And here we go, finally. Oh, yes, my worst game of the year. Oh, boy. Rise of Tribes was very tempting. Because Rise of Tribes is basically just a very boring, very dry civilization game where you're just basically area controlling on the board, people are in each other's faces all the time, and those dice with the, the moons and the suns, your turn can basically be so screwed over by pure luck of the dice. They just might roll badly for you. Or it might be so and so internal that the previous two players got really cool turns and then you're left with nothing. And it's just some phenomenally unbalanced. Some of those player powers are ridiculously unbalanced. I remember having one that barely got used and another player was continuously able to trigger his. It, it, not a very good game at all and some people still like it. I don't get it. Rise of Tribes was a big dud for me. Uh, Museum Rush was another tempting one. I mean, this is basically just a luck fest that you just move your guy around these museum tiles. You're trying to collect money from these various places. These cops are going around the board every now and again. And it just, I don't know, it just, it just felt very meh. I just really didn't get into it much at all. I couldn't get into the theme. It just, it had fiddly rules. There were some rules that I just thought, really, why is that in there? So I wasn't a big fan, but easily, this was the easiest worst game of the year. I do not find it fun to sit in front of people and do this. And that's not fun. I didn't like the predecessor of this game. I thought, you know, I thought it was a horrible title. I thought it was a horrible experience and mostly just luck. This one is just the epitome of it. People have come out with articles trying to say how strategic this game is. I'm sorry, you sit in front of your people that you're playing with, hoping to have a social experience, and you sit there and you don't talk at all. You literally just sit in silence and play cards in numerical order just to hope that you play them in the right order, with no information from anybody as to what you should play and when. I've got a middle card here, number 42. When do I play it? People are taking a while to do. Are they just being chicken? Or is it because they've got really high cards? I don't know. You have no basis to, for this information. It is purely guesswork. And even if you argue whether it's got strategic choices or interesting decisions, it's just boring. It's badly produced. It's, it's just boring. You just sit there and do nothing. You just sit there in silence and just play numerical cards and then the round ends and then you just do it again but you have slightly more cards that's the variation in the game why is the mind so respected by people i didn't want to put this on overrated because i don't think i mean i almost thought about should i put it on overrated but i thought well i can't put it on both overrated and worst you know and also i think for as many people that love the mind i think there's just about as many people who hate it as well you just tend to hear the people who love it more than the ones who hate it. That's why I'm here. But, you know, to fill in the gap, shall we say. But, oh my god, oh my god, the mind is horrendous. I hate this game with a passion. This is something I would rate a 1 out of 10. It's just not even a game, it's an activity. But even if you argue it's a game, it's a very bad game. Sitting in silence and guessing when you should play a card is not fun. I literally could just, I mean, you can break the game by simply doing a mental count in your head among all four players. Yes, people might slightly count out of sequence, but the amount of times you will succeed doing that more than when you fail will break the game. It's just not fun at all. And if you have lots of players, it is basically a chaotic luck fest. 
you might be able to say with two players you can get into your partner's head, but with four or five of you, you're just not going to do that. And, ah, oh, I mean, I just want to, I literally just sort of flipped, I mean, I played one game, literally I played one game where I was so bored, I basically flipped a coin every now and again. And if it came up tails, I played my card. That was literally what I did. I actually succeeded about as half as often as I did when I thought about when I should play the card. Ah, oh, the mind. So bad. And it got nominated for an award as well. Seriously, is as the hobby really downgraded to such a level that a game like the mind is worth a Spiel the Yaris winner? No. That's all the categories I got. Whew, I need to take a rest now and edit this video. But yeah, like I say, I've done some bad categories. I've done some good ones. Generally, 2018 was a solid year. And I can respect certain games, I can love a ton of games, and I can hate on a few games. You know, that's the same every year. But it's all subjective, it's all just my opinion. You might think an overrated game is your best game of all time, fantastic, go with it. That's your opinion and you're entitled to it as much as everybody else is. So, you know, it's purely just sort of my opinion of how the year went. I know some of you are gonna agree, I know some of you are gonna disagree, but again, Keep it civil, put it in the comments, I want to hear what you guys think. So that's it for me until season three. This is definitely the last video, last podcast, everything now from this point in the first half of January, I say, first couple of weeks in January when I start putting out more content again, will be season three. Whether the quality is an upgrade, I need your opinion. So when I do put out those videos and podcast scenes, please give me your feedback. You know, have they changed enough? Have they not changed enough? Do you want different, you know, different things done you know i'm still getting to grips with the software but i'm hoping it will be an upgrade i've got new camera batteries for these um lights so they shouldn't die out mid video again you know and premiere pro allows me to do color correction so i might be able to put some lighting effects in here that will make the video just a little bit less washed out so you know the stuff that i am considering and i will give more details when i start season three as to what format i'm going to do review videos in and podcasts in top tens and like i say you did ask for it I will do some solo playthrough videos, but again, just got to work out the kinks. So, you know, there's some good stuff on the way for 2019. But for now, have a very Merry Christmas. Have a great New Year. Thank you for watching Season 2 throughout its entirety, I hope, since mid-2017, I think, Season 2 started with my review of Baron Park. I think that was the uh, first one I did. But, like I say, thanks for your comments. Thanks for your feedback. Thanks for the positivity you've given me because trust me, this can sometimes feel like a thankless job at times when you get like the, the trolls after you and it's a stressful thing to do, particularly as a hobby as opposed to an actual job. I'd love to do this full time, but until three, 4,000 Patreons sign up to my campaign and pledge a dollar each, I'm not gonna be able to do this part time or full time. So I have to do this on top of my job which is already a pretty stressful job. So, you know, it's great to get the kind feedback from a lot of you, particularly at conventions when you come up and say hi, or even just on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, however you talk to me on there. So thank you guys. Have a Merry Christmas. Have a great new year. And just generally take care. And remember, it's only a game.